What's the power of AI? What if it could put an end to all the mouse clicks and keystrokes and make room for people to create? What if it could close the pay gap between genders by turning bias into equality? What if it could help the blind achieve more by using sound to give them sight? What if it could help cruise ships become more clairvoyant and car makers be more collaborative? What if a single collaboration between humans, birds, and AI could lead to conservation? What's the power of AI? It's infinite. But it has no perspective of its own, no point of view, no purpose, until people put it in motion, turning imagination into reality. Accenture. New. Applied now. Hi, I'm Marguerite De Leon, and welcome to Think PH 2018. We're celebrating our fifth year of discussing how creative ideas using technology can grow communities exponentially. This year, we're doing a roundtable series on the theme, Dear Future Self, Are Your Skills Ready for the Future? So we want to know how we can enable students to future-proof themselves and get the jobs that they want through our three-part ThinkPH Roundtable discussion. So today, tomorrow, and on Thursday, we'll be having these discussions live on Rappler from 4 p.m. onwards. Um, so if you want to ask us questions, use the hashtag ThinkPH on Facebook and Twitter, and we will try to answer them live. Thank you very much also to our partner, Accenture. So today is our first round table. Let's explore the question, who are you in the time of creative destruction? So we now live in a world where on one hand, technology is rapidly expanding and on the other, many skills are becoming obsolete. Um, a lot of skills are uh, now automated and a lot of people are losing their jobs. So what we don't realize is that to keep ahead of the curve, the answer already lies in our core. It's our humanity, our ability to think creatively and our training to think critically. So let me introduce today's uh, guests. First, we have my boss, <laughs> Maria Ressa, Rappler CEO and executive editor. Her professional journey has been marked by redefining journalism through new forms of media and technology. And next, we have um, Angelo Casimiro, a young inventor who's gained the claim for innovative and creative passion projects such as the InSoul Power Generator and the Life Size BB-8, which is adorable. <laughs> and next we have Abigail Mapua Cabanilla, the director of the De La Salle College of St. Pinel's Hub of Innovation for Inclusion, or HiFi. She established this platform to be an ideas incubator and space for collaboration with the aim of promoting sustainability and social equity. And finally, last but not the least, we have JP Palpalatok, the Managing Director, Digital Lead, and Intelligent Data and Analytics Group Lead of Accenture Philippines. So JP helps clients in their digital transformation through new and emerging technologies, including data, analytics, and artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, and content. So yeah, we have a very formidable uh, group today. So let's start with the landscape. When I think of creative destruction, I imagine reinventing practices or behaviors, um, renewing schools of thought. So using creativity to innovate, um, using insights not just based on aesthetics, but on solutions based on understanding human behavior and technology. So my first question for all you guys, let's do it one by one. Let's start with uh, Maria. The first question is, what for you is creative destruction? You know, I've thought about this a very long time uh, because <laughs> this this actually was a phrase by a man named Joseph Schumpeter. There He's an go. economist, right? And and he was talking there about the uh, the ec econ how economies have to are essentially destroyed by at that point the industrial revolution, right. um, and then have to reform. Uh, now, the World Economic Forum has come out with the fourth industrial right. revolution, which right. is information driven. Yep. And that's where technology has really shifted the world. And what you can look at first is how individual businesses, remember when we were talking about how Uber or Airbnb, Facebook, the social platforms, then after that it became disrupting 
governments in 2015 to 2016 and democracies, right? How technology enabled that as well. Uh, in November 2017, you had a study that said that uh, in 30 of 65 countries globally, cheap armies on social media rolled back democracy. And now we're at this stage where it does go down to like a guy like Angelo. Like how, how are you going to, what's the new world gonna look like? Because everything is gonna be completely disrupted. Um, creative destruction is you are destroying the now but creating the present and the future. Okay, thank you very much, uh, JP. Wow, <laughs> tough act to follow. I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, in terms of uh, uh, creative destruction, the uh, destruction, uh, I, my thinking there is really about uh, digital disruption. Uh, we talked about the port, port industrial uh, revolution, right? And we're seeing that uh, business models are being impacted, disrupted, uh, with the Ubers, with the Airbnbs. Uh, we've seen this actually uh, in the past technology uh, sort of like the pace of a uh, change of technology was very slow it's like you know one after another it, now we're seeing a, com a combination of all these technologies coming together whether it's blockchain artificial intelligence augmented reality and virtual reality we're now here and the question is what are what is people's uh, role in this particular area and in fact our technology vision is about people technology for people uh, and with the people uh, driving all of the direction for the technology as well. So there is an important role that people play in, in this particular space. Thank you, JP. Now, Abby? Yeah, so um, again, I want to add on to what uh, Maria said about uh, there, um talking about creative destruction. It's, I, I, what I li really like about it is that it talked about, it, it mimics natural systems. So it follows the usual cycle of, uh, of birth and death, of creation and destruction. So maybe to add to the conversation, because they, they, they did cover it really well, um, the question really is now in creative destruction, for me at least for, for the work that I do in academia and in hi-fi, for creative destruction, um, there are two phases, if ever. So there, there is the group that will really get destroyed, um, wiped out if they do not know how to jump in into the conversation and see the relevance. Um, and there are those who will actually thrive. That's the thing, there are those who will thrive. So the question for, for us right now in the academe is that, do, do the students, do the faculty, does the institution actually um, recognize this one? And what are we doing to deliver this one to, to the institution, to the students, right? Thank you. And in line with that, our student, yeah. Angela, mm -hmm. um, what is creative destruction for you? Well, to me, creative destruction is, um, let's say, a decade ago, people were using typewriters to write you know, right. journals, news, and everything, homeworks. And a few years later, it became obsolete and were replaced by computers. Now, when you ask, would you still use a typewriter today to make your homework or to do your schoolwork or, let's say, your work? Well, I guess the answer is no, because it was replaced with something more efficient, something more cost-effective, something that is more flexible. And I guess to me, that is what you call creative destruction. It's making something new to make life more efficient by replacing the obsolete ones today and by letting go of sentiments in order to pave way for a brighter future. Thank you. That was a great answer. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, now, Maria, let me ask, <laughs> like caught deer in headlights. <laughs> um, how, we keep talking about, we keep mentioning the word creativity. Like how important is creativity in this reinvention and staying relevant? Uh, even more now than ever. Um, you know, we, we talk about technology powering everything. And JP talked a little bit about the pace and how fast it is and, and that machines need humans. But the other part that's happening is the, ch the tech is coming so fast at us that it's hard for us to absorb it. You know this, right, from, from social media. Um, I think creativity now is not about, uh, it's not about reading a novel and understanding. It is about moving out of vertical silos right. and slicing across so that you can get multiple disciplines because this is active creation. Um, and so uh, Dr. Tabi, who is now going to do computers, who also obviously has a more artistic bent, 
art yeah. and science need to come together in this new world. And that's our challenge all yes. the time, right? I mean, in Inside Rappler, you know, in the past, we had the luxury of being able to just focus on if you're doing television, you do television. If you do that today, you will die. Right. <laughs> um, well, you've been in the media for 32 years, speaking of television. Yes, I'm and old. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so what have you been your observations on how Filipinos in particular have evolved and maximized the technologies that were available to us? I think as people, you know, we adapted to the information part of it extremely well because we were the text capital of the world before. And because, largely because our institutions didn't work so well, we did everything through social networks. So social media was actually just social networks on steroids. Um, so we adapted very well to social media and social media has been at the core of a lot of what's disrupting everything. Um, in terms of media, Rappler itself, I mean, we were ahead of the curve globally in terms of combining different things and trying to put this in your pocket. Uh, this is like meta if you go this way, right? You can see. <laughs> um, and now this is old. Yeah. You know, it was old after our third year and uh, the pace of it is just so fast. I think that um, journalism, media, television, the business is un under threat. It's an existential moment on many fronts, uh, both in terms of the business, in terms of technology, in terms of comprehension of our community uh, with things like uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, for us as journalists, how do we take that data, text data, and make it be um, readable uh, as structured data? There's so many, sorry, I won't go into <laughs> it. I, I'm just, there's so many interesting things. I, I would say if you're not touching natural language processing, uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, blockchain, if you're not touching any one of these four, even as a student, you got to go Google them and look at it. <laughs> um, well, you were referring to Angelo, you were looking at him. <laughs> I like, I like yeah. that he's here. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of which, a lot of the technology that's being developed now are being developed by people as young as Angela. Um, so I have a question for you. Um, in a world where young people like yourself are building apps for every imaginable activity, what made you want to build things in the first place? Like, what was your inspiration? Well, first, family comes first, then second, your country then. Sometimes you want to give or help back to the people that helped you with all the things that you dreamed of. And um, when you build something and you get it to work, especially when it is able to help a lot of people out there, it's one of the mo most rewarding things that you will ever experience. So I guess it's how you can make a change as an individual that makes me do th things more. That's great. But um, do you acknowledge that there are limitations right now in the current educational um, landscape? Uh, um, I graduated from the 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 old type of without the K twelve. <laughs> oh, right, right. So okay. So what can you say about about um, that? Do you think K twelve helped or? Uh, um, to me, before I th um, I think my limitation that day. Now, well, hindi ko, hindi, I can't judge them because I didn't come through. Yeah. yeah, but for me, um, seeing how STEM works is something the kids most probably need. Because b even before they enter college, they get exposed to um, the early parts of technology. So even before they study the theore theoretical parts, they get to see um, the essence on why they're studying the whole subject matter. But coming from my where I, <laughs> yeah, from where I studied before, the old type of uh, educational system. I use the internet na lang to supplement the things na yun, hindi pa masyadong tinuturo kasi nung time na yun, technology, hindi lahat tinatackle sa school since um, medyo bago yung iba-ibang, let's say, uh, programming, uh, microcontrollers. It's something new and medyo matagal bago mag -sync in yung educational system. And did you feel like you were an outlier? Did, did you have friends or, or people you knew in the school who also felt the same way but didn't have the resources? Or uh, um, do you talk to them? Oh yeah, um, when it comes to technology, there are mga friends who had the same rin yung interest, um, same rin yung experience before, and we just work together and we think of ways on how to make it happen despite um, our current limitations. But Mostly, na tumutulong rin naman yung school, so it's a big help. Okay. 
Okay, that's that's good. Speaking of schools, <laughs> and <laughs> Abby, you're a teacher. So in your experience as a teacher, yeah. how have students been adapting to this uh, brave new world right. of creative destruction? Like, do you think they're prepared for new digital, for this new <laughs> digital landscape? in the next few years. Well, I like it that Angelo is very optimistic. Right. And very kind <laughs> to the academic institution. Thank you. Um, well, definitely in terms of um, our students nowadays, the young ones, um, they're digital natives. Am I right? Yeah. You guys are digital yeah. natives. So in terms of adapting and being able to maneuver um, or manipulate that landscape, they can. You know? So definitely they can. I mean, I've been, I've been teaching since 2003. And now we set up this um, innovation hub within the College of St. Benilde. So I can see that they can maneuver. But I think where we're trying to push them is to actually, are they defining the landscape? Because it's one thing to adopt and um, to learn how to, to thrive with it. But it's also another thing to actually influence the direction of where it's going. So... Um, that's where we are. It's a very difficult path. So, I mean, we hope that we will have more students like Angelo who will actually start uh, tinkering with stuff and um, see where it goes. Uh, that's why I was asking him, how is he influencing his classmates? Um, yeah, so that's where we are. You've said before that um, <coughs> one of your beliefs is that we can shape the future we deserve. Yeah. <laughs> so we have a faint idea of what the future will look like, but so how exactly can we, as individuals, You know, you know what, I, what, I, what I noticed, um, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Filipinos are very reactive. I mean, if we, if we look at um, other nations, maybe even more the Scandinavian nations, I think there is also this, uh, this uh, is it a paradigm or a thinking that you know you are in the tropics, everything is comfortable and accessible. You tend not to prepare, right? But um, it's different nowadays. It's totally different. The landscape is different. Um, even the environmental resources are not as it used to be. So we need to think differently. So we need to be more proactive. But so I, in this way, I think that it's really, um, it is accessible. We could actually define the future if we actually expose our students, if we expose each one of us to the tools that can help us define that future because it can be done. It's just that we were not exposed to it for the longest time. So, okay. Thank you. Um, so moving from the educational sector to the corporate one, JP, um, I'd like to ask, what are the trends or developments you are seeing in terms of how companies are combining human ingenuity and technology? Yeah, actually, uh, our, our firm, Accenture, uh, actually uh, published a study uh, about the future of work. And in that particular study, we looked at, you know, we talked to a lot of CEOs, we talked uh, to a lot of the workers, and one conclusion there is that there is an acceleration of technology, and the way to seize the opportunity there is for human and machine to collaborate. It's about augmenting you know, the, the, the humans. Uh, in fact, when we asked the, the CEOs and the workers, about 97% of them said that they are planning to invest in technology and AI to augment the capabilities of their workers. So that's one of the main thing there. The other thing that uh, we also saw based on our, our analysis is that using and investing in AI, uh, we will have a 38% revenue boost in the next five years. And in fact, increase in employment, no? uh, about 10% if I'm not mistaken in the study. So there is a lot of opportunity for us to seize the future by focusing on this and focusing on human and machine collaboration. So how do you suggest other companies uh, adapt to this? Okay. So what we, uh, what we have said also uh, for the companies, there are three things uh, that, needs to, that needs to be looked at. The first one is actually reimagining the work. So uh, about 46% of the people that we interview said job descriptions are obsolete. We need to look at the work, right? We need to look at which particular tasks or activities will be done and automated and done by machine, and which particular activity and task will be done by humans. So reimagining the work is the first one. 
we need to pivot the workforce, which is the second one, which means that we need to get the workforce uh, into a culture that collaborates with machines. This is something of a change management uh, strategy that we need to focus on. And the last one is really very important. This is really about scaling new reskilling or uh, scaling new scaling, which is really about rotating the talent that we have, teaching them the right skills. Let's focus about, you know, when you talk about AI, there are new roles and jobs that we are seeing. We have trainers, the people that actually train the AI, right? That's number one. We got people that explain why the AI made that particular decision, the machine learning, the, you know, the algorithms. So that's the explainer. And the other one is the sustainer. How do we make sure that the AI is actually responsible and ethical? Can we eliminate bias? So that's, those are the three things that we are looking at. And therefore, we need to have a focused effort on reskilling people as well. So how do you suggest um, <coughs> students and fresh graduates get these new skills so right. they can thrive? Yeah, so there are several skills that we have identified. No? Uh, some of them, of course, are the things that we are doing, like you know, building tech know-how. Right? But that's one thing. So we have skilled families that we identify, build tech know-how. Of course, for you to you know, get that, but that particular skill, you need to read up, you need to learn. There's lots of MOOCs. Uh, you've yeah. done that, right? YouTube as well. Uh, actually, our, our, our company, Accenture, made an investment. No? We rotated uh, 100,000, 160,000 people uh, using this new IT. No? Uh, so we said we, you're going to be conversant, job ready, and you're going to be an expert of that particular technology. So there's focus on that. AT&T is doing that same way. Uh, there's the, this AT&T 2020 that they're focusing on. They identify gaps uh, and the demands that they have uh, from an AT&T perspective, and they're rotating their, their people as well, no? and training them to be data scientists, scrum masters, and, and the like. So that's one of the things. No? So there are six skills. So tech know-how, uh, learning to earn is really, really the foundational skills, which is really how do you get the, the, the skills for you to get work, no? uh, being like time management, interviewing, etc. Uh, the other one is really about applying WeQ. So you have IQ, EQ, WeQ, because the type of work that we are doing now needs collaboration and cooperation, yes. right? WeQ, right? So think about that. The other thing that we uh, said is about uh, create and solve, which is really about focusing on creativity and you know, critical thinking. And, and that's the reason why uh, we built the Liquid Studio. Uh, I, I think I talked about the Liquid Studio in, in, in the past, no? where we bring our clients there, we co-create, we co-innovate. Some of the ideas, we do design thinking, no? Some, some of those concepts there. We do a lot of work. It's cross-disciplinary discipline uh, you know, team where there's like a user experience uh, person that does the design. There's a technical person, a data scientist that focuses on the data. So it's multidisciplinary as well. Uh, and, and there's a lot of things that we can, we can focus on that as well. Okay. Okay, thank you. Maria, um, you work at Rappler, which is, <laughs> which is um, Notorious for having very young uh, employees. So Our median age is 23 years old. Really? I yeah. didn't know 63 that. 63% mm -hmm. women. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> now, <laughs> now I feel old. <laughs> no. Oh no, median <laughs> yun. Um, so what are the challenges uh, young people who want to get into this industry face given this um, creative destruction? You know, I love the way JP broke that down. I think part of it is when you're coming in, um, we... Job descriptions are really, yeah, they're out the door. Normal HR practices, they're also thrown out the door because the pace of change is so fast. Um, one of the things that we've started trying to do is to break apart vertical silos that we have, you know, your social media, your graphics, your video. We need to slice across all of these things and so we've started doing that. I think we've put a premium on folks who want to learn Mm -hmm. um, folks who have strong values, folks who know how to work together. Huh. I think this, this, that's truly important. And, and it's a very, as a reporter, it's, it's, a, it's different from the time when I was growing up. Mm. Because if we don't do that, um, 
the very strength of the reporter will be drowned by the change, the tsunami of change of technology. And so that's, that's a challenge that we have, right? I, I, yeah. um, <laughs> and we've reinvented ourselves. You guys reinvent yourselves mm, all right. the time. I mean, like when I got into Rappler, uh, I mean, I, I studied communications in college, but yeah. there was no social media course. There yeah. was nothing, <laughs> nothing I, I do now at work was ever anything I had to learn in school. Yeah. It was all just learned on the fly. So and you learn it, you systematize it, and right. then you have to change it. Correct. Right, yeah. How I fast? Mean, exactly, like <laughs> I, I've been here five years and like no year is the same. No one year is the same because we've always been changing stuff. So um, yeah, we need the kind of people who can, I guess, think fast I mean, on I, their feet. Actually, I, I, I would add that that is one area that we need to focus on, which is like the growth mindset, yes. being able to do, be lifelong learners, no? being able to learn more. As technologies evolve, you need to keep up. So this is what we call learning agility, yes. being able to be flexible when you yeah. need to change, right? So those are the things that we need to really focus on as well. Yeah. Uh, question for Angelo. Um, given the courses we have now, like what would you suggest uh, for uh, budding students to take now? Well, um, uh, yeah. Like, um, in the university they go yeah. on, um, they have MEM. It's one of their new courses. So it's basically about mechatronics, ah, nice. robotics, nice. mostly programming. It's a merging of mechanical engineering with ECE. So you get to build robots. Yeah. And one of my first course before I shifted to engineering was pre med physics. Mm. When I was younger, I wanted to become a doctor and at the same time I wanted to be an engineer, but those were two very <laughs> different courses. And uh, there came the course, so you could actually become a doctor and at the same time you could um, build or invent or let's say innovate um, new in medical instruments. instruments. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But eventually I also shifted out because um, the engineering course that I'm currently in is more in line with what I do and it's mostly about hardware, hardware development. So, yeah. yeah, I remember like there used to be a stigma on people who changed courses. <laughs> now it's a big, now it's a little bit more uh, accepted, yeah. right? Um, there's a bigger, uh, people are mo more open about it, right? Um, we have a question from social media for Abby. Um, from Mario Fernandez. Uh, Ivy League schools have all the resources to provide the much needed infrastructure for these innovative uh, concepts. So what about the rest of the schools that can't keep up? Like, especially here in the third world, okay. or developing world, sorry. Yeah, so thank you, Mario, for, for asking that question. It gives me an opportunity to talk about uh, one thing we do in the College of St. Benilde. Um, is we have this um, innovation, social innovation competition. It's called Benil Brace. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a university-based competition, national level. Um, so the incubation that we do um, at HiFi, Hub of Innovation of Benil, it's not limited to just students and faculty within the university, within the college. So we actually reach out, especially to provincial mm -hmm. um, universities and schools even organizations, we're not actually limiting ourselves mm -hmm. anymore just to students. Mm -hmm. um, anyone who wants to hack any of the sustainable development goals, mm -hmm. um, work on systemic problems, uh, we are willing to entertain and see how we could provide support. And we do this in partnership with companies, right. actually. Actually, I, oh, I just cool. wanted to add, right? Yeah. Uh, the companies are actually doing that as well. So we in Accenture just conducted what we call the Program the Future uh, competition. We invite colleges and you know, college students to hack and create an idea. Uh, in this year, uh, it's actually about Tech for Good, which nice. is actually aligned with uh, the initiative here. And to plug our Thursday <laughs> Think PH discussion, we will have um, several guests from Accenture and from um, the program. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we'll be discussing their prize and uh, the <laughs> cool app that they created. So uh, from Cebu. From yeah, Cebu. From These Cebu guys. Are they, yeah. yeah. They, yeah. Um, so let's see. Uh, still with Abby, do you have any anecdote on how students are unleashing their abilities? Like. What's an interesting thing that you've uh, um, seen in high five recently? Right yeah. now. Okay, one of the things that we are doing, so we are a two-year program, two-year-old program. Uh, we are presently incubating um, six or seven teams, um, five of which are Benilde students, 
One is uh, faculty driven, mm -hmm. and then the other one is based uh, our student teams based in uh, Father Urios University in Butuan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so nice. as all these projects, um, so one is actually working on um, how do you say this one? Uh, it's assistive technology for those who are visually impaired, mm -hmm. how to maneuver outdoors, mm -hmm. how to actually find their way outdoors. The other one is a Filipino sign language accompaniment. Um, so Benilde has a school of the deaf. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the companies are open to actually employing deaf. Um, so we want to be able to support the companies to um, be able to communicate with them. So we have this app which is actually available on Google Play and the App Store. Um, it's on beta, but I think it's doing well. Um, so we want to be able to help companies to actually be able to employ deaf. Uh, we also have a student team who's uh, creating sustainable Filipino furniture made, uh, made out of all um, upcycled materials. Mm -hmm. um, so these are all in prototype stage. So we hope to be able to release them, at least may able, be, make sure that they get to market um, by next year. Okay. Yeah, just a um, few. We also have another social media question, for this time for JP. Um, big data analytics and AI would be the forefront of the new industrial revolution. Thoughts? Yes, it is. <laughs> no, definitely. I mean, uh, the, the, way, the, the only way for you to have a successful AI is to have data. Okay. Because you need data to train it. You need to data to you know, make sure that uh, it uh, behaves and acts uh, the, the proper way. So if you think about uh, what are the five trends that uh, we publish in, in Accenture, uh, data is one of them. Right? And in data veracity is one of them. The next one is about AI, and we consider AI as what we call an alpha trend. It actually dwarfs a lot of the trends because everything eventually will have AI flavor. We're do using it now. No? Uh, when you do use Waze or Maps, you know, you use AI. So everything will be uh, infused with AI. So this will be something that's crucial there. But there are other technologies that are contributing to the speed of the industrial revolution. The cloud is one area because it becomes cheaper. Uh, from a storage and processing power perspective. Machines are becoming faster as well. And blockchain, as mentioned by Maria Ressa here, is actually one of the areas that seems to be interesting because of, from a uh, frictionless business uh, perspective, this is something that is important as well. Maria, uh, speaking of blockchain, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, you know, one of the things, jumping off of what JP said about AI, I mean, the world's largest intelligence company, I would say, is Google. Yes. How much intelligence they have about about us. And it's a real time. Um, it teach, You plug it in, so you give your information there. They take everything. So, so anyway, leading to that, um, <laughs> what are the other things? And it's good, I guess, in some ways, although it brings up all these things, GDPR, the Correct. privacy GDPR. issues, right? These are Compliant. all new problems. Correct. Um, uh, on Facebook, social media, uh, using both humans in Myanmar. Let's talk Myanmar before the Philippines. Mm. Let's not talk Philippines. Myanmar, 10,000 people killed. Um, a UN uh, commission went in. They found out that military generals had created Facebook pages that fueled the violence. And then Facebook took all of the pages down of the military generals. This was all just last week. And all of that is work that was done by real people, people, um, Burmese, Mian residents who spoke uh, the language and then are fueling the artificial intelligence. Um, so these, these are real world things. Sorry, no, so now I forgot the final part of the question that you had. No, I was, was just that? asking about blockchain in blockchain. general. Blockchain, <laughs> you know. Allah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Um, very good answer. But, it, Sorry. but it's interesting, right? <laughs> <laughs> AI but but your answer weird. was better than my question. No, no, so this is where I will say blockchain. I think the Philippines, even though you don't really know it, we're playing in blockchain in a big way, but it is startups who are doing it. Um, Nick Snoliado has several uh, startups. Uh, this is, you know, he had the first uh, consumer tech company that went public in Southeast Asia. Nice. Uh, and he has done very, very well in blockchain. I sit on, I don't know if you, if you go, if you're on Facebook right now or you Google, um, civil. Civil is looking at the problem of both monetization of news okay. and fake news using blockchain. And the Civil Council, I'm one of the first five members in that, uh, will, has created a constitution that will be open to the public. So this is something that will be fully transparent mm. using blockchain and artificial intelligence. Yeah. 
We didn't build it. We're just the, I, I sit on the council and it is just rolling out now. So civil tokens are for sales. It's an experiment. Don't know whether it'll yeah. work, but you have no idea what's yeah. going to work, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, Angelo, I have a heavy question to ask you. <laughs> Please prepare yourself. Um, so, uh, hold on. I, um, if you had a chance to talk to your younger self, what would you tell him? Um, Within this context. <laughs> uh, sige. Um, I guess I'll tell my younger self to do uh, to continue to do what I was doing back then. But I guess I would wish that I could have told myself na to study harder when it comes to academics. Back when I was in high school, I was a bit carefree when it comes to grades. Because there are certain subjects na minsan hindi ko alam kung bakit ko inaaral, minsan hindi ko maisa puso. But then when I entered college and I, and I learned how to make things, how to build things, how to innovate things, doon ko nakita yung essence kung bakit mahalaga yung high school. The education, the math, and everything, it's your foundation. Without it, um, you're mas kulang cool yung knowledge mo to build things. So if you had more, you could actually build something bigger, something better, something brighter. So I guess you know what I said to my old self, ko siguro. Study harder and try to appreciate the mga efforts that you learn from your teachers and profs mo back in your ki kids, you know, younger days. Actually, now that I think about it, I would love to hear what you guys would tell your <laughs> younger selves. Um, yeah, given this context, uh, Abby. <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> I wasn't prepared. Sorry to for put that. you on the spot, <laughs> but. Um, Maybe because I see myself now as a harbinger or a facilitator of curiosity mm -hmm. is really to, because I think that's the role of, of, of teachers, of educators. I mean, we can't possibly know everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know a lot about blockchain or AI, but I can actually facilitate learning towards that. So maybe to further on uh, nurture that curiosity, um, and then can I can I slowly veer away because I'm sure. so <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Like, I'm I'm so I'm so uh, affected by by Angelo's answer <laughs> in terms of studying. I guess what's really important is for as a student for us to really find out the why, mm. the reason behind things, because a lot of times um, we get taught a lot of concepts, mm. but. It, whether it's a failure on the side of the faculty or the teacher to actually explain the why, but maybe deep inside of us. I mean, if we could nurture that, that desire to find out why am I doing this? Why am I doing these things? Why am I learning this? I think that is one key ingredient that will take us, um, will make us thrive into the future. Um, aside from the fact that JP also talked about collaboration, um, if I could have collaborated more <laughs> when I was younger, and I wish um, schools could actually um, do that uh, inherently. I mean, right now, a lot of the students do it on their own. I mean, extracurricular, right? What, what if we design the education to be more collaborative? Because if you think about what the market needs, it's not disciplinary, it's not in silos. If you think about um, systemic problems, it's not, it's not in silos. It's a, it's a work of different disciplines. But what if we could actually start doing that from preschool <laughs> to, to higher education? What if we could actually start uh, designing the system to be like that? So students, faculty learn to work on projects long-term rather than just, you know, I, I create a project, I submit, and that's the end of it. Because we don't build the, the tenacity of an entrepreneur, of somebody who will actually create things, right? So I wish I could have done it when I was younger. Mm. And, but I, have the, I, ha, I think in my position right now yeah, as you're an doing educator, now, yeah. um, this is what we do. This is what we tr at least try to prepare yeah, our that's students great. for. Thank you. And JP? Okay. So it's hard, huh? <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, um, I, I think I'll take it from a personal level. No? Uh, I'm a BS Mathematics from Ateneo. I wish that I've learned more math, uh, or at least <laughs> remember all of the things that were, were taught by my professor, because one of the most uh, important and sexiest job right now is a data scientist. Yes, that's <laughs> true. <laughs> and a data Shout out to Rappler's data scientist. <laughs> right? 
Sexy eh, daw kayo. <laughs> because I, I think if I sort of like took that to mind and use that as well, I, I think this is the place to be, right? Being a data scientist, using data, using machine learning, etc. That is the best thing that you can be during this time, this, this particular era. That's my, my perspective. And I think I'm older than everyone here. So oh, it's not for me, <laughs> no, but, uh, but for me, I think like it's art and science. Yes. Right. Um, would I do anything differently? I wouldn't because when I was young, I went to art and science, nice. like the fundamentals yes. of, of this stuff. And the science courses I took when I was younger in college um, actually helped my reporting. You know, mm. the, the sarin gas attacks in Tokyo, mm. for example. Mm. Mm. I actually was able to look at the molecules mm. of mm. the sarin gas to figure out what it was. The stuff that we're doing now all came out of that. It's science plus art. art. Yes. Yeah. And, but I'm not, JP, I'll never be a computer science major because my, or, or math. I'm just not that good at it. I mm. accept that. Right. Um, but I think I can be creative on top of it to figure out what to do with it. Yeah. And the, the one thing I will say that I use in everything, this one law from physics, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, mm -hmm. that the very act, like it's that electron, radioactive electron, to know the position of the electron, <laughs> you shoot a radioactive electron into a closed space mm -hmm. so you can measure the deflection. Yep. But the minute you knew where it was, because you deflected it, it's no longer there. Correct. I think that's... That's the metaphor I use for mm. almost everything in life. <laughs> and you got it from science. <laughs> and it it's from, from science. science. Actually, yeah. science and religion are tru truly intertwined. Yeah. But I love what you said about the why. If you know the why, then you're cool on almost everything. I think you understand the why behind those uh, theories and principles. That's why. <laughs> I think all, in the end they come down like why why did Angelo switch his major it comes down to the why yeah. right. why did we set up Rappler we knew what we wanted to do yes. why journalism why are we standing up we know what we want to do so you figure the why then all the other stuff I think fall into place they do yeah. and the last well the, can I toss a question oh, sure. <laughs> uh, four year courses right I mean is that necessary and is it right <laughs> for this day and age? Yes, actually. I mean, with all the online courses available, I mean, for, for me, it's not about learning software, but when you talk about collaboration, you talk about critical thinking, cool. yeah. could these be actually content instead of, uh, instead of a lot of information, yeah. which you could actually get somewhere else? Somewhere I, experiential. Somewhere experiential. <laughs> and some, some, to actually do things that are relevant. What if, what if corporate, academia, and government could work on live projects in school? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. What if we can? Why live not? projects, not theoretical, yeah. not Why abstract. Not? That would give the students way more. Exactly, um, right? We it's have like a way of consol consolidating great minds in order yeah. to work together and to form new ideas. That's really collaboration cooperation, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> Making sure that everything works out. Yeah, from different fields. Yeah. One university that's doing that is AIM and their data science, right? Mm -hmm. They give real problems to the data scientists they're training. Yeah. What? Uh, it's anyway, Joshua. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, we're almost about to wrap up our great discussion. Um, we have the la last two questions. Um, the last two uh, are for Angela, and the last one is for Maria. Uh, Angela, um, we were asking about your uh, what you would say to your past self. What would you say now to your future self, given what you're doing now? Mm. <laughs> future self. I guess um, do everything for your family, do everything for your country, and do everything for God. And um, never, give up, never give up if ever you'll encounter some, th some hardships or let's say some failures in life. Because failure is actually your best teacher in order to move on and move forward. And uh, whenever I make something, or let, let's say I build something, I keep on feeling when it comes to a certain part. But I always tell myself that I should never give up. Otherwise, I wouldn't achieve my goal in life if I gave up there. So I guess, um, yeah, just never give up. Okay. Thank you. And uh, yeah. To all the students watching, listen to him. He, he knows what he's talking about. Um, okay, so finally, for our parting thoughts, uh, Maria, the question, uh, there are notions that someday machines will replace humans. So what are your thoughts on that? 
you know, uh, movies are great. <laughs> yes, they are. Uh, and, and, you know, if you go by the singularity, mm. by, I think it's almost 2030, is yeah, that when that's we're supposed to hit singularity, which is when machine can become sentient. Mm. Um, look, the reality is almost every complex problem has been tackled by a combination of uh, artificial intelligence machine that will do a lot of the work that will surface the insights so judgment calls by smart people <laughs> can can go through. Right. I mean, from from the the applications of like PayPal, Correct. right? They couldn't figure out how to deal with fraud until mm. they included people into the mix. Mm. To disinformation, people have to be in the mix, but they have to be culturally the one. They need to speak the language and Correct. be of the culture. So I I don't think it's going to go away anytime soon. But who knows what we're going to invent? Mm. What will artificial intelligence? evolve to will it evolve and then it's just so fast mm -hmm. i think the hardest part now is I f it's breathless it and corporations also ha don't have the luxury to even do a workflow before the technology changes mm -hmm. how do you how do you deal with something like that right it's the pace our human capacity to absorb change um I like the sci-fi movies. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, for a quick recap of what we were talking about, I think the three biggest points that I was able to glean from this discussion. Um, first is the importance of the person, the individual. At the end of the day, no matter how um, mired we are in technology, it's really about what the person, the individual can provide. Second, the need to embrace change, no matter how fast the world is moving, no matter, and no matter how comfortable you feel in your current situation, um, you really have to just go with the current, or maybe even ahead. Right. And finally, it's important to build the kind of environment where the people, the individuals, and this embracing of change can happen organically. Um, wouldn't you agree? <laughs> okay. All right. So. Um, Thank you very much to our guests, Maria, JP, Abby, and Angela. Um, tune in tomorrow for another of these online discussions at 4 p.m., the second part of the series. Um, so tomorrow, it's uh, Think PH unlocking the creative potential of young Filipinos. We'd like to thank our partner, Accenture, and thanks also to LBPI for our lovely setup today. <laughs> I'm Marguerite De Leon. Thank you so much for watching. What's the power of AI? What if it could put an end to all the mouse clicks and keystrokes and make room for people to create? What if it could close the pay gap between genders by turning bias into equality? What if it could help the blind achieve more by using sound to give them sight? What if it could help cruise ships become more clairvoyant and car makers be more collaborative? What if a single collaboration between humans, birds, and AI could lead to conservation. What's the power of AI? It's infinite, but it has no perspective of its own, no point of view, no purpose, until people put it in motion, turning imagination into reality. Accenture, new, applied now. 